Are you ready for the word of the Lord this morning? Yes. I'll tell you, Jeff and his team have just done an incredible job. The men really, oh, we've, we've so enjoyed that. And now it's time that the whole church gets to enjoy the, uh, the, the message, the teaching, the preaching of Pastor Jeff. Why don't you come on up here and just take your liberty, Jeff. Share whatever the Lord's put on your heart for this congregation today. We get a valley welcome for Pastor Jeff Wallace. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. My brother, obviously from another mother. Yeah, that's right. You know, we look so much alike, I thought I'd shave my hair so people wouldn't get confused. God bless you guys. Will you do me a favor? And uh, I, I appreciate the welcome. But can we just appreciate Jesus together? Come on. Come on. Let's appreciate Jesus. You're here and I'm here because of Jesus. So let's just appreciate Jesus together. Is that all you have for Jesus? He saved your life. He's drawing you unto the Father. Praise God. Come on. Praise God. Let's just make it all about Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. What a wonderful, absolutely wonderful uh, time in, in the presence of God. As Pastor Lynn said, that worship was phenomenal. You know, and, and we appreciate all the giftings that, that God brings to this house and our house over at Overcomer Covenant Church. And maybe some of the visiting churches that are here, there's a lot of gift, giftings in the body, but there's nothing like the people entering into that place when the people enter into that place then we all get to encounter Jesus together and so thank all of you for participating in worship amen you know Pastor Lynn said uh, I think you said do what I gotta do right you know that could be run right up to four or five o'clock that be okay? We'll, we'll take an intermission probably somewhere around 4.30. As he said, I'm Jeff Wallace, and I'm the men's pastor, associate pastor at Overcomer Covenant Church in Seattle, Washington. And we greet you on behalf of my senior pastor, Pastor Gordon Banks, his wife, Pastor Deerzette Banks. They send their love to the family and to all of the friends. And and we want to believe that we'll continue to do more with you, with the men's ministry and, and whatever we can do to just come help edify the body in the valley. I really feel strongly and boldly in my spirit to say that this church will be a prototype of what it's like to embrace everyone for the love of Jesus Christ. I'm looking out here and it's, it's already a beautiful body of people, a diverse body, young, old, black, white, just doesn't matter. And we're all here just serving the king. So well done. Give yourselves a hallelujah. I brought a couple of our men's leaders with us. If you guys would stand up, Bob Burton and low toe, low toe, low toe, low man, low, high man, low. And, and just so you have an understanding of why I haven't pronounced his last name uh, correctly, can I get a mic real quick? Lo, grab that mic and tell us your last name. Um, they call me Lo, it's short for uh, Talai Lotu. Uh, my last name is Sally Elmour. So okay, that's probably why Okay, now you guys say it. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Call him Lo. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, these guys, uh, solid men. Uh, I go into battle with these guys, and we, we travel together, and there's nothing like having friends and, and men who uh, have a passion to serve Jesus uh, wherever he calls us. Uh, Bob and I have been out to Wisconsin sharing the same message that we shared with the men here. Let me just give you a couple, uh, take a couple minutes and share. We talked about distinct men. It's really falls in line with authentic manhood. And it was, it was an honor to come up here and worship and weep with my brothers that were here this weekend and 
dance and praise God because we want to live a distinct life for Jesus Christ as men. And what that means is we're done talking about Jesus solely because talking about Jesus is good. But it's time we start living and looking like Jesus everywhere we go. Because you guys have all heard actions speak louder than words. And so we can't come to church and jump and shout and cry together and then go home and live an opposite uh, reflection of that because that's not compelling for people to come. That's repelling for people to stay in their stuff. And so I'm thankful for the men. There were some 50 plus men that were here uh, throughout the weekend for our first time. This is say our first time. Say so we're going to do it again. And it's going to be greater. Amen. That's, that's what we believe. If every man just brought one man, we've doubled. Okay? And so uh, I'm excited. And Bob and Lo, thank you again for being with me. I appreciate John Wolf. Um, if, I, if I just may share, just to God be the glory. But um, he was impacted this weekend, and he has a heart to support the cause of Jesus Christ in men's lives and so he registered for an event that we do over in western washington so if you guys would just keep john in prayer um, and and there's the invitation has been extended to a couple of more if you want to know about that more about that gentlemen come up and see me or or my staff here after the service amen, amen. let me pray father we thank you for this time together lord and we just pray your blessing over every home represented here god let your presence be evident when your people cross the threshold of their doorways, God. As they walk in, as they pull into the driveway, Father, let them enter into your presence on their property, in their house. We thank you, God, that there's warring and ministering angels in every square inch of their home. So that they can't help but commune with you throughout their day. In all their doings, let your grace be upon them so that we together could be a better reflection of your son Jesus, Yeshua. We thank you for these things. Empower us today. In Jesus' name, all of God's people said. Amen. If you were Steve Haruza, he'd say, and every man needs a, or no, every woman needs a, amen. amen. <laughs> Whoa, I'm sure glad I corrected that. Moving on, not even going to entertain the conversation beyond that point. Hey, in Luke 14, verse 28, Jesus in the scripture is teaching about the cost of discipleship. Say the cost of discipleship. He's talking about if anyone doesn't hate, he uses the word hate. He says, hate mother, father, brother. Sister, aunt, uncle, whoever it may be that you might feel is close to you and, and that it's your responsibility to love. He says, if, if, he, if you do not hate, and then he says, even your own life, he says, you cannot be my disciple. And then in verse 28, he says, don't begin until you count the cost. Say, count the cost. Look at your neighbor and say, hey, did you count the cost? Look to the other side and say, I bet you didn't. No, 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 just no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. That's not fair. Oh, sorry. Then he says, for who would begin construct construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Say, I'm a finisher. I'm a finisher. Now say it like you mean it. Thanks for showing up today. Let's consider just a few of the cost of discipleship. You know, if you are impacted 
by having a strong encounter with Jesus, that things shift in your life as it did for me. Some of you know, I can't assume that all of you know, but I was bound by addiction for 31 years and I had a radical encounter with Jesus some 13 years ago. Radical. One night's prayer. But I was so miserable in the life that I was living and leading that when I encountered Jesus, everything changed. And so then I had, to, I had a couple of options that I can bask in this presence and I can seek more of this. I mean, for 31 years, I was seeking things of this world and, and I was thinking that I was going to find and fill a void by chasing the things that the world offered, whether it be alcohol, drugs, and beyond. I mean, it was absolutely ridiculous. And I got to a place where I was hating what I was doing. I hated the lifestyle I was leading. I hated how I wasn't fathering my children the way I ought to father my children. I, I really hated and despised that I wasn't loving my wife the way I ought to love my wife. All the while, I was being equipped to hate what God hates and love what God loves. And I started chasing after Jesus and falling more in love with Jesus and, and seeing those options and those temptations and the ways of this world are still there. And, and I, I had a choice, you know, certain weeks after. I had this crazy encounter, but their choices were still there. The drugs were still there. The social circle was still there. All these people were still there. And, and I had to consider what, is, what, what direction am I going to go? So if we're going to consider the cost, I had to consider my social circle that before I had in, in, in prior to encountering Jesus, there were some friends that I thought were really good friends, but really those friends weren't the friends that could better and take me to the next level. So I had to, I had to consider. I had to count the cost of what it would be like to separate myself from friends that weren't going the same direction. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't love those people any less or any more. I love those people. They're great people. They, they were just being deceived by the same things that I was being deceived by. But it was best for me to part from them so that maybe they might someday see what Jesus can do for their life because they see what Jesus is doing in my life. Amen. See, because when you separate from some things, it hurts, doesn't it? God created us to separate us. But every time he separates us, he elevates us. Our life story is separation for elevation. You know, a, a family member just had a beautiful baby, and, and that baby was connected to mom for the last nine months. And when the baby was born, there was a separation. Why? Because it's time to mature. Mom might make the decision to nurse the baby for however long, and, and they're gonna, there's nurturing that takes place and coddling that takes place, and, and mom knows that she's there to take care of the baby, and baby knows that when it's time to feed, that mom's going to take care of her, and then there's going to be an opportunity where the baby's going to mature, and then mom's going to have to put the baby on a bottle. And let me just tell you, just by experience, I've got four beautiful children, and it was always kind of bothersome for my wife because she knew that they were maturing. So there was a separation for elevation. And then, of course, mom's playing, and they're at this toddler age, and, and we're hanging out, and everything's good, and we're laughing, and they're falling, and they're skinning their knee, and mom's helping them up and putting a Band-Aid on them because Lord Jesus knows I don't like blood. So mom's taping there, putting the, the bandages on them and all these things, and, and then all of a sudden, they're, they're to the age of going to school. And mom's got to put them on a bus and trust them in, into the care of someone else. And so we see, again, there's another separation, but maturity is taking place. They're growing. What am I trying to say? The cost of discipleship, there's some things that you're just going to have to leave. It might hurt, but in it, you'll be elevated. God wants to elevate you, so you have to consider Consider this, this walk. Consider the cost of discipleship. You might have to give up control of your finances. What does that mean? It's his. We all say often, 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 we in the church, believers, we, we talk about 
Oh, everything's the Lord's. Except for my wallet, Lord, you know. <laughs> Dear Jesus, you know I have a better account, accounting system than Matthew did. You know, Jesus. No, but it's his, isn't it? He provided for you, didn't he? You know in, Ma in Malachi where it says, bring me the tithes? Do you know that you can only insert that word if it belongs to you? That word bring? I could look at Tom and say, Tom, bring me your wallet. Tom's going to look and say, Pastor, you're nuts. I'm sorry. I don't know you. It doesn't belong to you. I could look at Nate and say, Nate, bring me your car. Nate might be like, why? It's my car. What are you doing with my car? I don't, I don't think he would be stingy with it, but... It doesn't belong to me, so I can't use the word bring. I would have to ask the question, is it okay if I borrow your car? God said, bring me the tenth. He didn't say bring me all. He said, bring me the tenth. So what am I saying? A disciple understands that I, have to, I might have to give up control of my finances. I might have to just be a better steward of what I've been given. I might need to honor when the men and women come to the platform and they talk about tithe and offering. I, as a disciple, see, you're considering the, the, the cost right now. Many of you, I can't assume that all of you believe you are walking and living like a disciple. My encouragement would be to consider living like a disciple. And disciples of Christ have the understanding that a tenth goes to God. The mindset is a tenth is going to the man. No, forget that. Don't entertain that. You're reasoning with the wrong voice. The tenth goes to God. Just honor God and everything that we do is what the scripture says. That's a cost. You might have to give up control of your finances. You might have to give up some time. You might have to give up career. The disciples did. Jesus came through and he looked at the fishermen. And this is their livelihood. This is their provision. This is how they ate. This is how they survived. And he said, come follow me. The next word in the scripture in many translations says immediately. There was no reasoning. Now, can I just throw out a disclaimer? Jesus isn't calling anybody to quit their jobs tomorrow. <laughs> Sorry. But I want you just to catch what it would be like to be a disciple of Jesus. Is to be willing in heart to do what Jesus would call you to do. So let me just ask you a question. Have you considered? This is just for you. Just, just something to reflect in your own heart. Have you considered what it would be like to walk on this journey that we call life on earth as a disciple of Jesus Christ? Have you considered? Have you even thought about it? I, 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 I propose that question for you to ponder because there could be a chance, like most believers, is we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and we applaud that and we want to continue to draw people back to the Father by giving them the opportunity to accept Jesus. We want to keep doing that. But that's just the beginning. It's just a foundational piece of coming home and living in eternity. It's just, it's just the beginning. There's so much more for God's people. I believe that there is a strong and drastic contrast between a believer and a disciple. A disciple considers the cost. This is important. Here's why. Because I believe that there's a really good chance that believers have some things that they just don't want to let go of because it hurts. It's difficult. See, a disciple says quickly, immediately, I'm going to follow Jesus. A believer says, well, I don't know. I, I, I really still like these friends and 
I don't know if I want to give all that time, and I don't know if, you know, uh, people in my social circle are going to like that all I'm doing is talking about Jesus, and all I'm doing is reading the Word, and I'm going to small groups, and I'm going to kids' camp. Whose kid was that on the screen? <laughs> Whose kid? Wave, come on, wave at me. Back here. That kid's awesome. Man, if I'm a disciple, I might have to show up at this man camp deal. Who's this guy coming from Seattle? I don't even like Seattle. The Seahawks are horrible. <laughs> so believers, there's some things that they want to hold on to. Disciples, there's a contrast. They consider what it's going to look like. And not for anything for them. They, a disciple considers what they can bring to the body of Christ. This is important. We've got to catch on to this. I believe that believers might, might take the opportunity to come and, and receive Jesus and confess him as Lord and Savior of their life. But then they get out in this violent society that we live, and they find themselves drawing closer to what they were trying to leave, more so than drawing closer to that which they want to love. See, because we have what they call the absent and the unfulfilled. Disciples make a decision, and that decision is solid, it's final. Distinct men. We make a decision and we're going that direction. We're going to follow Jesus. And we know everything that we talk about and everything that we do, it has to be built and set on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And that's it. If it doesn't fit that picture, I'm not doing it. If it doesn't fit that picture, I'm not saying it. If it doesn't fit that picture, I don't want anything to do with it. Why? Because my foundation is Jesus. That's a disciple. People have been pressed with and tempted and drawn away from their walk of Christianity, their walk of following Jesus. Because I don't know that they've considered the cost. Do they want to go to the next level? Do they want to receive the elevation that awaits them? The pioneers of this church, Norm and Ruby, can we appreciate Norm and Ruby? Yeah, come on. We honor you. We honor Norm and Ruby. Why? Because some 48 years ago, 1971, they moved into this area. God put something in their heart. And I'm able to come here and stand on this platform and preach the gospel because the cost is considered. Starting in a schoolhouse. Fast forward to 2002 and there's been some transitions and things in between the time then to now. There's been some things that have gone on, but guess what? We're all still together because the foundation was laid properly. The foundation was Jesus. And so in all of the transitions, there's got to be caution has to take place as to who might come and build on this foundation that they too would remember. And we'll read the scripture here in a minute, a minute that they can't build on anything but Jesus because that's the foundation that has been laid. So we praise God and are grateful for pastors Lynn and Renee. Amen. Pastors Rich and Kathy, we are grateful. Why? They understand that the foundation for everything that Valley Church does is it's got to point back to center. It's got to come back to the principle of first thing. What's that? Jesus. We're all here because of Jesus. 
Is it okay if I preach about Jesus today? Okay, I, I, I probably should have asked before I got started. No, I shouldn't have. See, if the foundation wasn't here almost 50 years ago, there's a really good chance we wouldn't be here 50 years later. There's a good chance that this building, this structure, this beautiful structure wouldn't be here if it wasn't laid on a, a really good foundation. And, and I would imagine it, it, it took the, the cement layers and, and Brother Rudson and, and the team uh, a, a certain amount of uh, intentional time to consider what was going to be erected on this foundation. And, and so they had to make sure that the measurements and everything uh, were perfect and precise so that this structure would last, so that we can have this time together today, and that young man that was on the screen will have that time together in the future. If it was set on dirt, there's a chance that it would erode and decay in and, and the building, and it just wouldn't last. And, you know, the winds are pretty strong here in the valley. I found that out the other day when we were flying in. And my team and myself, I preached this message over in Seattle the other day and on Wednesday. And so we knew as it was dancing in the air, we were going, our foundation is Jesus. Yes, it is. Yeah, foundation is Jesus. Solid foundation. It's been thought out here. And a solid foundation is really extremely important because it brings strength to the facility and it brings stability to the facility and it brings security Amen. Jesus for our walk on this journey called life on earth is our strength our stability in our security. So if you catch one thing from me as we start moving forward, everything you do, every innovative idea, every opportunity for ministry begins with Jesus. Yes. Hear this. If anything's being written, planned, laid out, and hasn't been communicated with, with Jesus, I'd put it on simmer on the back burner and come back to the beginning and have a conversation with Jesus. Why? Everything we do ought to come back to the center. Everything we do ought to come back to the foundation. Because that foundation brings strength, stability, and security. Amen? If you take anything today, grab a hold of that. That's what changed my life. Coming back to center. Jesus. So let's turn now. We're going to talk about the foundation of discipleship. 1 Corinthians 3. 1 through 23. And Paul here is dealing with some stuff, the church of Corinth. And in this, he's, there's a lot of talk in the earlier chapters about wisdom and, and intellect and all these different things. Well, here he's, he's calling the church to a point of spiritual maturity. Can we start with that? I want to believe this mature house of God is going to another level. I'm glad a couple of you got that. Say grace. Okay, I'm going to say it one more time. I believe that Valley Church, as the prototype for the valley, is about to go to a mature level in the things of God. See, when words like that are cast out, you want to receive it as a corporate body. 
and you'll understand why by the time we finish this today. And when I say prototype, there are phenomenal churches in the valley. We were talking about uh, a couple of them last night over dinner. It's, there's great stuff. But somebody's got to initiate what it's like to network. Is it Justin? Thank you for bringing your family here and networking with this house. You serve a great house. That's where I'm going with that. There's some networking going on, and it's going to be a prototype where the body of Christ in this valley is going to be one and operate as one. First Corinthians 3 and verse 1. Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk to you as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in Christ. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And you still aren't ready. For you are still controlled by your sinful nature. Catch this. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Underline that in your Bibles or highlight it in your technical or what do they call those? Smartphones. I am smarter than what I just portrayed, honestly, but I really had to think because Steve says he has a dumb phone. It's, it's, it's a flip phone. And I haven't agreed with you ever before, but I'm kind of feeling convicted that I should agree with you now that, yes, it, it, it is, Steve. It's a dumb phone. Doesn't that prove that you are controlled by your sinful nature? Does it what prove? Jealousy and quarreling with each other. Aren't you living like people of the world? When one of you says, I am a follower of Paul, and another says, I follow, I follow Apollos, aren't you acting just like people of the world? After all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believed the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. Paul is addressing the congregation as infants, and worldly because of their jealousies and quarreling with each other. Say we're going to another level. (laughs) Paul asked two challenging questions. Doesn't that prove that you're controlled by your sinful nature? Or said another way, doesn't that prove that you really don't understand spiritual things? Often we portray that we do. We come in and, hallelujah, Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. <laughs> and then we leave, and we're living a separate life. Our men learned this weekend that we are no longer going to live a chameleon lifestyle. Yeah. The other question, aren't you living like people of the world? What's he saying? That's what the world does. We're supposed to be set apart, holy. It's supposed to look different. I'm not saying religious. I'm saying loving to everyone. Let me just tell you, we don't, Justin and and Pastor Lou, we, we, we can't take the valley. We can't take the valley. Let me just go here just for a second. If we as men first don't get our homes. Us men have to serve in our home. We can't serve our community if we can't serve in our house. See, so when we serve in our house, our home, our residence then we become proficient at serving in the house of God. And it's then when we're all serving and playing well and there's no jealousies and no complaining and no arguing in our home and in the house, then we get the valley. Say we're going to another level. We have to. So our men learn that they have to check their own heart and begin serving wives and children in the home. Not lording, loving. Loving our wives and our children in our home. And let that become a habit so that it'll bleed into the house of God. 
And so then the house of God becomes the prototype in the community in the world. Amen? Amen. So Paul identifies two problems. Let me just give you these two problems that are identified in the scripture. Loyalties in the church are causing the problems in the church at Corinth. Because people are choosing. I follow Lynn. I follow Rich. I follow I follow, I follow. And let me just say that there's, there's nothing wrong because Pastor Lynn might communicate a way that resonates well in your spirit. And Pastor, T, Pastor help me, Rich might teach in a way that helps you understand the word of God. They're both doing the same work and it is okay to have the understanding that one delivers in such a way where it becomes a problem is when it is starting to cause division in the church. When it starts to become a whisper, yeah. Oh, Pastor Rich, can you believe? That's when it becomes a problem. They're both serving the Lord with the gifts that they were given to edify this body of people so that they can go into their community and do the work of the ministry, as it says in the scripture. The people were not unified. Let me just paraphrase this out, and I encourage you to look at this scripture on your own and and let God give you some things. They were not unified due to status and intellect, and maybe one has a little more charisma and this and that and the other. This still happens today in the church around the world. Oh, man, I'm only going to listen to so-and-so, man, because he's got fire. He's got charisma and so-and-so. I don't ever want to go to church. Let me just tell you, if the doors are open, everybody should be in church regardless of who's speaking. Everybody. Everybody. And we should all be unified in this one thought. That Sunday morning, I have a DVR, so I'm going to record the game. Can I get a hallelujah from the ladies? Lo, Bob, you guys are going to have to protect me on the way out of here. (laughs) Some of the guys are getting a little bit frustrated. Let's continue reading. It's not important who does the planting in verse 7 or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. What's important, I like that amen, so let's just read it again. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. That's important. The one who plants and the one who who waters work together, say together, with the same purpose. And both will be rewarded for their their own hard work. For we are both God's workers and you are God's field. You are God's building. Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation, here's the warning, must be careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we, have, we already have, and that is Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on Judgment Day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will, will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? Look to your neighbor and say, really? Just kidding. It's another one of those. Don't do it. Don't do it. God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Stop deceiving yourselves. If you think you are wise by this world's standards, you need to become a fool to be truly wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. As the scriptures say, he traps the wise in their snare of their own cleverness. And and again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. He knows they are worthless. So don't boast about following a particular human leader. For everything belongs to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Peter, or the world, or life, or death, or the present and the future. Everything belongs to you and belongs to Christ, and Christ belongs to you. Say amen. Amen. All right, let's start landing this plane. God is good. I want you to realize three things as a disciple of Christ. 
What's number one? Christ is the foundation. Don't forget that. Just, just don't forget that today. Christ is the foundation in everything that we do. Just hold on to that. Let that, let that be your cry in everything. The plane's shaken. Christ is my foundation. Kid you not. I mean, we laugh about that, but that's... that's Bob looked over across the aisle at me because I, I travel, you know, fairly often. And, and he said to himself, he goes, well, Pastor Jeff looks calm, so we'll be all right. <laughs> Little did he know I was only calm because I was repeating in my spirit, Christ is my foundation. Christ is my foundation. Christ is my foundation. And because I repeated it, there was strength, stability, and security. So we have fun with that, but there's some truth in just repeating and getting used to saying and being proficient at the fact that Christ is your foundation to everything you do. Can I get an amen on that? Christ is the foundation. He said in verse 11, for no one can lay that on, on the foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Nothing or no other plans or no human can add or take away to what already has been laid out for all of us. Don't be fooled. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. See, I trust you, God. See, I trust you, Jesus. It says, do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in the things that you want. Is that what it says? Help me read. Help me finish that. Seek his will in all that I do. That's how I read it. Seek his will in all that I do. And he will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Paul references in in our main text. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil, it says in the scripture. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. How many of you want healing for your body? How many want strength for your bones? How many want stability in life? Seek Jesus in everything. Just seek Jesus in everything. Seek Jesus in everything. Come on, say that with me. Seek Jesus in everything. Come on, now shout it. Seek Jesus in everything. Everything. He wants to hang out with you. He wants to hear from you. He wants to help you navigate through your, the issues in life. If you're struggling with anything, seek Jesus. The scripture, if, you, if you're a disciple and you're standing on the scripture, it says, He will make your path straight. See Jesus fixing some things in your life. For those of you that are struggling, you've got you to get to a place where you can visually see in the Spirit and by the Spirit that Jesus is lining some things out for you. Then you've got to get your heart behind it. Stand firm and say, I'm standing on my foundation, Jesus Christ. Your bank account is not your foundation. It's not your foundation. Jesus is. Amen? Amen. Number two. Grab a hold of this. We're better together than not together. We're better together than not together. Help me. We're better together than not together. We are better together, help me, than not together. As an individual, you are better together with Jesus than not with Jesus. Corporately, you are better together with Jesus than not together. Community, partnering churches, we are honestly better together than trying to figure out how we shouldn't be together. Honestly, are you kidding me? Do we really wake up and figure, try to figure out how we shouldn't partner with the other church across the way? Don't you know that that's like just frustration and added stress to your life? That's a person that wakes up and says, oh, how can I be miserable today? 
Hmm. That's a lot of work. Knock it off. Quit complaining. Quit grumbling. Let them be who God's created them to be. That'll, make, that'll allow you to be who God's created you to be. Because he didn't create you to be crude and rude towards the brother down the road. Man, if we can just be proficient, huh, men? At looking at our own heart and working on that plank instead of trying to take care of the speck. We're better together than not together. Paul said it. Don't take it from me. If you're not going to take it from me, just take it from Paul. He said it in verse 16. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in all of you? It takes all of us. It takes every one of us. Everyone that can hear this word today, it takes you. Don't think of why you can't. Let him speak to you as to why you can. And then you take that. And because of the love of God that is in this house, come and hang out with this wonderful leadership and let them activate some things by the Spirit so that you can be a part of this outstanding work that God is doing in this house and beyond. It takes all of us. Why? We're better together than not together. How many of you have big family gatherings at, let's say, Thanksgiving? Can I ask, don't you just love it when, when mom, you love this? Okay, John, I'm going to talk to you. It's time to get up and, and you put the turkey in or roast or ham or fry the chicken, whoever you are, doesn't matter, right? You wake up early and you, you cook and, and everybody's coming around and you put out the snacks. You got the little celery sticks and little gross cheese can stuff. I love it, but it's honestly really gross. I eat it all the time. I probably shouldn't eat it. I mean, or the peanut butter and the... That's not so gross. Peanut butter's bomb, right? You put it in there and you get the little chicken biscuit crackers. How many of you get the chicken biscuit or the better cheddars and you put those out and, and the olives and in the mashed potatoes? I know, I know. I'm going somewhere. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. I know, I know. It's okay. I know, I know, I know. I know. This is really bad before lunchtime, but just hang in there. It's going to make whatever you eat taste that much better. And so you have the salad and the fruit salad. How many do fruit salad? Oh, come on. See, I got you now. How many of you? Who does pies? Who does cake? I'm coming to your house. I like cake. I'm a cake guy. My wife's a pie lady. So, so, so there's both at my house. And, and then everybody eats and we laugh. And there's sparkling cider everywhere and, and juice. And, oh, we're having a Christian party on Thanksgiving Day. And then it's time to clean. And don't you love it? We're all happy and we all get up together and we all go in and we, we take care of the dishes together, don't we? <laughs> For some reason, the men are nodding their head yes and the ladies are going, that's not how it works in my house. <laughs> For some reason, we're not together on that piece. Okay, so, do you hear the laughter in God's house? That's really how it should be in God's house. We're better together than not together. Everybody has something to bring to the plate. Our men are going to start serving more in this church. Come on. Men of God say, I'm ready to serve. Okay, I'm going to come down there and look at those of you that didn't say it. I'm going to give you another chance. Say, men, men say, I'm ready to serve. Come on, really? One Sunday a month. If every man that said that in here serves one Sunday a month, it shifts everything in this house. Shifts everything. Amen? Amen. Don't be the guy that waits for everybody else to clean the dish and then dishes so you can go to bed. 
Some of you got that. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 and 6. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but they serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in all. In God's work, we have to know that God is directly involved in that work. He gives the gifts, the use of the gifts. He empowers the gifts. The places of service, how you serve, with whom that you do serve. What you're serving in, I'm telling you, these blueprints were formed and made before you were in your mother's womb. He knows why you're here. It's time to get involved. Or be the individual that sits on the couch while everybody else does the dishes. Can we just bring it home like that? Don't be that person. Use your gift. Be grateful for the gift that you have. Well, I don't know what that gift is. There's outstanding leadership here, School of Ministry, that can help you figure out what that gift and purpose is. Get involved. Amen? Amen. Here's where we're going to wind this down. Is there a chance that I can get some keys? We're going to slow this thing down, and and we're going to pray for some people. Say we're better together than not together. Okay, guys. Let's be intentional in every way possible, and all of this applies up to this last point. Let's take this point and let's be intentional. Let's be intentional to unify the church. Let's make that a charge for all of us. My guys over on the west side, they know we were out at the event that John Wolf signed up for called The Return. And we had a staff meeting between some of the exercises that the men do out in the wilderness. And I called the guys together. I said, I want you to know this is an outstanding team. I stood on the hill and I watched the men. There was some probably 20 staff members at this event laughing and serving and working well together and cleaning dishes and chopping up firewood and doing this and sweeping. And just. And I'm standing on the hill just touched by God. in appreciation for how well they were working together. And so I was able to share that with them when we all sat down and, and I said, I want you guys to know that I'm in a season of doing whatever I can to unify the body of Christ. And I said, and it starts with us, guys. We have to be the example. Here come the tears. If I can get some Kleenex from somebody. Are you going to make me bend over? Don't you see I have my skinny pants on? You're supposed to put them up here. (laughs) Come back, Lord. That's my heart. So to hear you say, Pastor Lynn, uh, what a joy it was that you could have a team from another ministry. It just, it makes my heart smile. Well done. Well done. This last point. Let's make it intentional. Let's unify the body of Christ. And what that looks like is we're unified. We laugh together. We cry together. We work together. We serve together. We are together. We receive when the seed is sown together. When it is taught, we receive. When it is taught, we receive. We understand. We are of one mind, one accord. We march to the same beat. Jesus loves us. And guess what? That's how it is in your home. Husband and wives are together. Kids see husband and wives together, so guess what? They're together. They'll follow. We're living in a time where things are more caught than taught, so you can tell them what they're supposed to do, but if they don't see you modeling it, it's not going to get done. 
That's why our men are going to become great servants in the house. It's time. It's time. That we get proficient in the house. And it becomes proficient in the church. And then we get to go into the community. We get to go into Starbucks. And, and it doesn't matter who's sitting across the aisle from another church or who's sitting across the aisle and they might not disagree with what your, your way of thinking, but you're not going to judge them because we're, the emphasis would be to unify. When we're more concerned about proving our point, honestly, we're really just proving our fruit or the lack thereof. So let's quit trying to prove our point. Let's do more listening than talking. It's interesting, when you listen, you get to understand. But when you're talking, you don't hear to understand. And that's true in our prayer closet. When Jesus was teaching the disciples how to pray, he said, go to your secret place. And in the same text, it says, he knows what you need. Now, I'm not saying don't make your request known. Make your request known. But when you make it known, shut up. <laughs> Listen. Get a journal. Why? He wants to make your path straight. And if we're doing all the talking, we're not receiving the instruction. we can have everybody just close their eyes rest in his spirit right now feel his presence right now embrace his love for you right now he loves you he knows you he knows you're here close just hear my voice we didn't get to finish the scriptures that I have in my notes because the Spirit of God wants to touch many of you so if there's a struggle in your heart if there's a struggle in your life whether it be relational Will there be some things that have clung to you? Whatever it is, if it's a struggle, you have an opportunity now to hear by the Spirit of God because re He's revealing it to your heart. He's speaking to you and you know who you are. This is an opportunity to let go of some things and move forward. Let me insert, if you have never given your life to Jesus Christ so that you can begin to consider what the cost would be to live on this earth as a disciple of Jesus, I extend that invitation to you too. But as the Holy Spirit has identified the struggles, the hurts, and you're looking for some guidance, you want a touch from God, by the Spirit, I'd like to see you be bold before God and His people and stand to your feet right now. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. We have time. Amen. Praise God.